and uh, welcome to the session. I'm just going to, we're now going to go to a live broadcast, if it works, and just move some stuff. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. Never mind about that. So let's, re the recording has started, so let's get to it. So, um, sorry, everyone, just one moment. And here we go. So, stop that. so welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. And I've got a great guest of panels, people here to uh, speak to you about women <laughs> in film. So I'm uh, just going to hand over to our team. We've got Kate Ogborn Rosenbosch, Lisa K. Crixado, and Lisa Marie Russo. We just want to thank our sponsors for the work for the City of Angels Women in Film Festival, which starts tomorrow. So we've got Film Freeways, r &L Acquisitions, Apropos Productions, Click for Festivals, Fest Home, Bella Blanca Event Center, where the award ceremony is going to be. Give it a shout for Shout and Women IP today. So um, we're going to get to know our panel in a bit, but uh, just quickly, I'm just going to ask you if you'd like to do a poll. So I'm just going to uh, launch a poll here, and you should be able to see that. If you can't see it, just put it in chat. But how many of you here today, and this is conclude our panels, how many of you, uh, male or female, felt that you've been discriminated in any way while working in the industry? If you'd mind voting, just so we can get an idea of how people have felt, and it could be any type of discrimination, depending on the city and place that you live got people are coming in um yeah it's quite interesting it's about 60 mm. percent of you have voted i'm just going to leave this open for one minute it's just coming up to 40 seconds so i'm going to close the poll i think everyone except one person um i'm just going to share the results mm. it's quite interesting yeah what do you think rosa well, I'm surprising, I guess. But yeah. I think it's interesting if, uh, if you know actually the age, because obviously my generation is a little bit different, I think, than, than perhaps, or hopefully, yeah, hopefully yeah. different than uh, women starting now. Yeah, yeah, or, or even aware of it, I guess, as well. Yeah. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, good. Well, and the next question I'm just going to put here, and that I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to put another poll up just for you quickly. Just we're just going to do a few polls to get started. What about opportunities? Because this is a big thing for us. Do you think that being a female or female identifying person has reduced your opportunities in the film industry? So, if anyone, if that's relevant to anyone in the audience, um, if you wouldn't mind voting. So it's yes, no, or unsure. So do you think being a female or female identifying person has reduced your opportunities in the film industry? Yes, no. Okay, it's quite interesting the results. Most of you, I think 10 out of 12 of you have voted. So maybe some people can feel it was relevant. So there's the results. Um, yes, so being a female or, uh, it's kind of tied, yes, no. I mean, this isn't scientific, unsure. Well, I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, all of them, yeah. Uh, 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 it's quite interesting, but. The fact to me around that is why should it even be an issue? But unfortunately, I think a lot of people still feel it is. And it is if you take a look at sort of things that are happening and have been happening for, uh, well, I can talk about all sorts of things, but I'm not going to. That's not my job today. Um, the last question is, during your career, do you think that opportunities for women or female identifying people have become better, <laughs> become worse, stayed the same or unsure? This is the last poll, just so you know. So keep a voting. Nice, 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 nice. Everyone's voted, yay. So these are the results. Uh, become better, which is what we like to hear. Some people, one person, or one out of 12 said stayed the same and one unsure. Mm -hmm. So uh, really what we want to do is just find out about some fantastic film careers from some, some major, major 
women, but also some wonderful, wonderful people, most importantly. So I'm just going to hand over and uh, just get to know the panel. And I'm just going to stop sharing. I'll stop. Some, oh, there's some lovely faces I can see now as well. Some beautiful people here. So um, let's go over to um, Lisa K. Crisado. If you want to just introduce yourself, the festival, and then okay. we'll throw over to another person. Well, thank you. I just want to thank everyone for being here. It's just a, a, a great opportunity to, to do this with Paul and with an international uh, group of just amazing women and uh, I'm not sure if there's any men out there but everybody who's here I'm I'm just really pleased that we're doing this I I'm um, I started as an actress uh, I moved into producing and writing um, I actually you know was acting primarily until I made a real effort to learn as much as I could about producing and, and I started bringing things together on a film after I'd been cast and then I started to get opportunities as a producer and um, it just I just feel that the more uh, you do in the industry the more opportunity you create so then I launched uh, I won't delve into all the details but I, I launched City of Angels Women's Film Festival in, in um, 2019 we sat out last year but um, this has been an amazing experience because everyone it has been really supportive and, and I feel like there's a real moment now for uh, a women's festival in Los Angeles and we're bringing together a lot of great people. So that's all I have to say right now, but thank you for, for Lovely. Asking. Oh, pleasure anytime and I'll buy you a drink next time I see you or, or, or two. I'll hold um, you to the call. You will, you, you will. Call. And who do you want to hear from, Lisa? Kay, uh, let's go next. to Kate. Let's go to Kate. She's next, isn't she? Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, well, I'll try and give us, there's a sort of long answer and a short answer to, to uh, inevitably, because we've, we've all been around a bit. But um, I started out, I guess, I, I started out not really knowing what jobs in the industry were at all. I had studied film, but it was a purely academic degree, so it didn't really prepare me for a kind of job in the industry. And I thought I was going to be a writer. I thought I was going to be a journalist and an author. And I actually got a kind of incredible opportunity while I was still a student um, and slightly uh, extraordinarily was commissioned to write a biography of the American actress Jean Seberg, which I embarked on after I'd graduated and then realised within about two and a half minutes that it was a complete disaster and I wasn't a writer <laughs> and it was going to be... But I plugged away at it for a while and then it kind of fortunately all fell apart and I stopped having to dream about being a writer and thought, OK, right, I better find something else that is both, what is that thing that is both creative and collaborative? Because the thing I hated most about the experience of trying to be an author was being on my own and being solely responsible for my own kind of, for, for the creative for the creative output really and for the for the whole evolution of the project. So I was kind of look, thinking, I didn't know what that was. And via various routes, I ended up as an assistant at BFI production at a time when they had a small fund for independent films. Um, and I was assisting the head of production there who was quite a kind of eccentric egomaniac, um, but, actually, but actually not a kind of, not a terrible boss because he gave a lot of opportunities to the people that were working for him, including women like me, who at that time was completely and utterly inexperienced, but he would throw you happily in at the deep end and, um, and give you kind of great opportunities. So it, I then started, um, I got an opportunity to exec produce a, um, a scheme for new talent, um, that the BFI was funding with Channel 4 and so I did that and that kind of that started me learning about producing um, and how how that worked um, and then moved into feature film um, from that point you know sort of after about I don't know quite a long time doing shorts but kind of eventually moved into long form and then uh, ran had a company with Lisa Marie who will um, talk about her own experiences and then moved into producing episodic television um, in 2017. So I've kind of worked as a producer and an exec producer. And I'm very, very, very happy not to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. You've got, you got a very good photograph of you by Bob Willoughby. So, you know, hey. Some, <laughs> that was the, that's got... the fun benefit of the book that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we going to hear from? Kate, do you want to hear from? Let's hear from lovely Rosa and then we'll finish off with Lisa Marie, if that's all right. Lovely Rosa. 
Okay, I'll try to do the short version taking on from Kate because the long one, we haven't got enough water on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Spanish born, but I married an American guy. So I was in LA and by sheer fluke of fortune, I started working for the then called Filmex um, as, in, as it became AFI Fest. Not because I had any training, I actually studied chemistry at school, didn't finish, uh, but because I spoke languages, so I was useful in terms of international guests. And from then on, I had a little bit of an epiphany. Film festivals were a format that really uh, I thrived on and loved. And so from then on, Latin American programming, first LA Film Festival, London Film Festival, break, I then probably made the ill-fated mistake of moving into the business side. It seemed like from having done festivals, production and international distribution were natural fits again. I sit probably a much more comfortable in any culture that is not mine. Um, so from then on, I moved on to doing kind of a left field, weird and wonderful films. Uh, bunch of weird Mexicans called Del Toro Cuaroni Nyari to weird little music, uh, Cuban music film Buena Vista, all sorts of things. But what I guess is my real ethos is I don't have one ounce of a producer's um, ego. We all have defenses. You need the defenses. You need to understand legality, accounting, and human relations. But I am not the kind of producer that buys a book and the right of a book and spends 10 years um, developing. I, I pick people, I follow people, or hopefully people pick me. And so what it means is I have a very wide ranging international sales launching um, the last 10 years because oranges are not the only fruit. I also love doing photography, uh, video art, uh, any kind. The only thing I've not done yet is opera, produce music, Basically, the skills are the same. Um, I've been, all of this international world work has always been based in London. And uh, recently on the arrival of Brexit, I thought it was high time to go back to Spain and have the chance, uh, I left Spain when I was very young, but to have the chance of be and work for the next few years as a European. And so that's where I am now, based in, Span in, Span in Spain. Um, I do anything from the recent Matt Dillon film that you've just seen premiere in Telluride, El Gran Feyove, to a recent announcement where I've partnered. So having done Mexican, Cubans and all that, I have partnered with uh, two gay women who are a couple filmmaking wise, Mina and Besela, which are the Bulgarian born directors of Women Do Cry that was in Candice here. And uh, previous film in Locarno. So I guess I now have <laughs> expanded my range to the Balkan new wave. So I think that's the short version. What do you think, Kate? We'll go out for a drink and hear the long version sometime. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and I love you. Uh, people may have missed this, but uh, Rosa claims to be seeking asylum as a Brexit tier refugee. <laughs> So we do miss you. I've put in your case to the Home Office, but Boris Johnson, you know, he's got other things. My darling, I don't want to come back. I know. <laughs> I didn't leave because of papers. I left because I didn't want to spend the rest of my youth locked down. The rest of what's left of my youth locked down. I don't want to come back. Oh, well, I think, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll uh, keep calling. Other, the, other uh, than to have a bottle of champagne with the four of you. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. And, and let's know now, uh, anything else, Rosa, before we go on to Lisa Marie Russo? Lovely, Lisa Marie. Hi, everyone. Uh, so um, I went to high school in South Jersey, and um, I loved typing and photography and uh, journalism. And that's when those things were really seen more, maybe a bit more as like craft oriented things. And they were also kind of a lot of people from working class backgrounds would kind of gravitate in that direction. Um, I think I thought I would be some kind of like grisly old guy out of a like black and white film, like getting the story. So I studied journalism at Penn State. Uh, I did a semester abroad in Manchester 
and uh, met people doing documentary. And I thought, oh, that's what I want to do. It felt like a combo of, of journalism and, um, you know, and, and images. I got a job at WHYY Public Television in Philadelphia, and I worked there for nine years. I started as a PA, craft services. And uh, which I have to say, they never really had in the UK till the Americans got here. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I became a director there in the main. I, I did live television, directed live television as well. But I was a producer director of like small cultural documentaries. And it was interesting because I said no to those questions about feeling discrimination uh, because I think documentary in the main has always had space for, for women. Mm for lots of reasons. It's personal stories. People never made a lot of money. It was harder, you know, harder for men to move in the way they did in Hollywood uh, to kind of take over. So it wasn't something that I really thought about a lot in my career. But I do think a, a kind of a question that could go along with that one is, have you ever been bullied? To which I would say uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't think that was necessarily around gender. I think mm. it's around some of the lunatics that work in the film industry and are, are allowed to run rampant because they're creative or whatever. Uh, and I think that's a really big thing that still continues to need to be addressed because I don't think of myself as a person that could be bullied because I'm quite sultry and Italian American and yet it still happens. But anyway, swiftly moving on, I moved to the UK in 1994 to be with my boyfriend who then became my husband and uh stupidly thought oh I don't want to do docs anymore I'll do fiction where I knew absolutely nobody <laughs> um but I was very quickly introduced to Kate Ogborn by Johan Insanali and she worked at the BFI yeah and uh we became friends and I just started doing a lot of short films I did a little bit of tv drama uh I did run a fund called Digital Departures, which was like low budget fiction film, uh, uh, feature and doc films. So I, uh, and then Kate and I set up Fly where we, you know, I would say you guys just look at the website. And then if you have any questions about that, you can see, but we did films with some big people like Terrence Davis and um, Ken Loach. But we also worked with Andrew Cotting, who's a brilliant artist filmmaker. That's our film with Andrew. If you can see that swan down poster um and we did a lot of we did a lot meaning 72 short films with young people uh age 16 to 24 three minute films and that was really super fun and a big learning curve I, for me about how to you know how to work with new talent and give them space and and let them make their mistakes because how bad could it be at three minutes um and we made some really great things and made film with paul as well so in that in that scheme so I then went from that to running the BFI Doc Society Fund, which I did for three years, three and a bit years. Um, the British Film Institute uh, gave the documentary portion of their funding to an independent company. And there I've exec a load of films. I think I've finished about 10, we're finishing the 10th or 11th now. Um, and won an Emmy and a BAFTA and a... a Grierson Award and more Grierson nominations, really fun. Lots of shorts on that um, and a big support program. And I recently stepped kind of back from that running it and I'm a consultant on the fund working on select titles and like, you know, thinking about my next steps, but it's um, really fun to be a consultant. That's what I'll say about that. Mm -hmm. And as you told me once when you were, um, I think it was who you were exec producing something, um, I remember you saying exec producing is fun. It's funner than producing. Because there I was taking, I mean, I haven't had this, I've had this headline since I was 24. So I didn't have to worry about losing me anymore. But yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. It was, and it's great to work with you as an exec producer. So anything Also, else? can I say, because Kate, Kate undersold herself in a very British way. A, she's, mm. she's a beautiful writer. <laughs> um, but also has just made a fantastic show called The North Water, which is on is in the UK and in the US. And she was in the Arctic. If you can get a screen, if you can get a still or a screenshot, put it up, Paul, because you're like, oh All my right. God, Kate was out there. Yeah, no, the and Arctic. if you, if you, and if you Kate Ogward, friends, you can see her jumping into the Arctic. Where, where was it, Svalbard? Where were you jumping in? I loved that. 
We were um, at 81 degrees north, which is the furthest north that any drama's ever shot. So basically oh. we started in Svalbard, which is an island off the coast of Norway between Norway and the North Pole. And then we sailed over a thousand nautical miles further north out into the pack ice. It was utterly incredible. I mean, one of the, I mean, I don't know if it's, it's it, one of the things that I've sort of reflected on since kind of moving into TV is that I kind of, as a producer in TV, the role is like, the role is very, very similar to producing in film, but the kind of hierarchy is, um, is slightly different. But what I've had the opportunity to do is to work at a scale and with kind of scale of budget and complexity of production, you know, uh, at a much, much bigger level than I ever had the opportunity to in film. And there's a bit of me that thinks, I don't really understand why, because I'm the same person with the same <laughs> skills. But somehow I'm trusted to take, you know, a, a crew of 100 and Colin Farrell into the Arctic on a TV series. But no one would have, no one would have come near me if I'd been pitching that as a film. I would have been wow. made to work with, I would have, think I would have been made to work with a man. Yeah. I, just, I do actually genuinely, I do think that, I don't, I don't know if the others agree with me, but I do think it's just an odd, kind of slightly schizophrenic situation in a way. I don't, yeah. yeah. Well, and also on that male female question about, you know, changes in the industry, as I said before, you know, there have always, from my perspective, been a lot of opportunities for women in documentary, but the big change, obviously, and then I'm, and I'm talking about directing and producing, but, and, you know, women in producing of all genres, but the big hopeful, one of the big, hopefully one of the big shifts is women directing fiction. When I was directing documentaries, I never in a million years would have thought that I could have directed a fiction film. It never even crossed my mind. Yeah. Whereas now people, I think, think of themselves as storytellers. They're, you know, everything's up for grabs. Uh, I, I think Jane Campion, if I may borrow from the good, because we always steal from the best, if we can. <laughs> Jane Campion has been articulating this for the last year, brilliantly. There was a sort of, with me to, whatever rights and wrongs, no change, no historical change is forever perfect. There will always be rights and wrongs, but the impetus, something happened on this. And as uh, Jane Campion put it, there was a sort of a fall of Berlin Wall. There was a before and after moment. Now, mm -hmm. this, why should it be expected to, to be correct or, or perfect? The French Revolution was, they killed a lot of people and it was wrong, uh, but there was a change that brought us on to something. Not that I'm comparing this to the French Revolution, that's a bad example. But I think if we accept that there has been a change, look, I am not that old, although I was a certain age, but when I started in LA, where we still had a thing called Telex, so there was no electronic, I, I started really just before the advent of the first fax machine and the first sending digital photographs and all that. And even when I became deputy director of the London Film Festival, for which I was far too young and unprepared, so much of the correspondence that would come from Asian institutions, Japan Film Institute, Eastern Europeans, they were always addressed to their Mr. Bosk. <laughs> it was always their Mr. Bosk. The <laughs> idea that it would be a woman. I mean, and indeed, both myself as deputy director and Sheila Whitaker, who was director, we were the first two women on the post. But this went on for years, my darling, of getting, so clearly something has happened. And, you know, to close it, and that's what Jane Campion recently was saying it in Venice, something extraordinary has happened in my yes. life. I don't know in the lifetime of all of you, but for the first time in my life, a woman has won the Oscar, the Palme d'Or in Cannes, the Golden Lion and Best Director in Venice. For the first time ever, it's a woman. Which is, and if, I'm not counting things like the wonderful New Zealand woman winning the Emmy for the crown. Uh, what's her name? Was it really for that? I mean, it's happening at a velocity. If you think that in the history of the Cannes Film Festival, only one woman had won the Palme d'Or, Jane Campion. So the change is there. Now, change of this kind is very complex and it will take a continued supply 
and a continued impetus. As, as I think Kate put it very well, probably 10 years ago, not even in film, in television 10 years ago, okay. they could send it some posh explore, explorer from the Royal Geographic Society or something to babysit you or something like that. I don't know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, but now it would be very difficult for anyone to say that a woman of your capabilities and force could not handle the show. So the change is very big, that we are not there. Who cares? The motion is on. And that's, I think, what matters in the end. Because if the motion is on, we move. The momentum is, is really building. And my question, I, I have a question for you. Do you think, Rosa, do you think, how much do you think the Me Too movement, which started in the US has influenced all of this or, or to what degree is your opinion on that? Well, I think the Me Too is beyond, beyond film. We're talking about film. Yeah, right? yeah, no, I, I realize that. But I'm saying, you know, we're talking about a cultural shift too with women beyond film that, that does, uh, you know, affect the film industry in it my opinion. It only does, but I think women are more now. The finances are different. Although right. you can say back in the days of Ida Lupino and Catherine Hepburn, some of them were trying to buy material, the studio system would not allow it. And in the 70s, so that was 40s and 50s, in the 70s, the cool cats were the boys in the motorcycle and the girls were the bimbos having the California dreaming, kind of, even in the case of Casabetes and all of that. Now is the first time where, say, the Oscar last year is because Frances McDormand wasn't waiting for a studio to give her money. She put her hand in her pocket and bought the rights to Nomadland and yeah. went and looked for a producer and made it happen. So I think the difference is that as you grow in security and assertiveness and right. are less effective and less defensive, you Absolutely. Put money where your mouth is. Um, and, and there's many more women now than there has been. I mean, still, we are not anywhere parity, and I don't even know if parity is important. I think the mathematical numbers are a way of trying to guide the momentum. But in the end, this is not about mathematical equalness. It's about whoever is good should get ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. We also know absolutely. some women filmmakers who try to play the reverse yeah. of the coin, some women filmmakers who try to play the women filmmakers card, but in effect, they are perhaps on the mediocre side <laughs> and it's been proven. Well, so yeah. fair enough. But it's about equality, yes, but absolutely. But also don't need to put them down. Men make good and bad films. Women should be allowed to make good and bad films. Absolutely. Yeah. But also absolutely. isn't it, sorry, Rosa, on that, and this is why I love your brain and, and I love spending time with you guys in uh, Soho years ago. We, if you don't know, we all shared an office. It's a numbers game. Because if you're not getting like, you know, me, me and Lisa Crisada, we started as actors, you know, you knew, you know, I know that I book one in 10, if I'm good, it'd get a recall, right? And, and I see that the same with directors and stuff. If you're not even getting into the industry or finding it, you know, like as Kate said, not being, being allowed to go on that trip to produce, you're not gonna get the chance to make good and bad products. So you're just not gonna get known. I think, I think what changes the trust, I think Kate really nailed it. The moment you get trusted, things happen. If you don't get trusted, nothing happens. Also, I think another thing that's changed, and sent, I mean, this is just from my perspective in terms of the sort of UK, and I really can only speak of the kind of TV industry because that's what I've been working in for the last few years. But I think what's changed is that there's now a kind of both an expectation and a pressure that you wouldn't have, it would be unusual if you had a show that was being directed by more than one director, that you wouldn't seriously consider having 50-50 parity with gender. Um, I just think it's kind, I think, I think there are, there will be shows where you do have two male directors and there will be shows where you have two female directors. But I think it's, I think the conversation will always happen about look, make you know looking for both male and female directors rather than kind of automatically um not looking for women directors and right. when i did um the end of the fucking world which is the first tv series that i produced we because of the nature of that show which was um a, you know, essentially an incredible two-hander between a male and female character 
um, we kind of said, we said from the outset, and um, the, the Jonathan Entwistle, who had, who basically had optioned the comics and had set up the show, was obviously going to be the direct the first four episodes. So we just said, we are, we will have a woman director direct the second block, and we're not going to consider a male director for that. So we just sent a message out to all the agents and said, you know, we're only, we're looking for a woman director. And then when you get the list back and they'd say, well, what about, you know, they, they've always put on a few men and we'd say, no, sorry, we, we have said categorically for this show, we already have Jonathan, this is the nature of the show, this is what we're looking for. We're not going to, um, for this show, we're not going to meet any men because we want to find a woman and this is going to be the most effective way to do that. So we just sort of made that commitment really clearly and Channel 4 were completely on board and that meant that, you know, the, the director that who directed that second block, Lucy Cherniak, actually had a very similar background to Jonathan. They both came out of commercials and promos. Um, they both were writer, they both had worked in independent film. They were both actually also writer directors themselves as well. But I think it would have, I think she would have been perceived to be probably less experienced if we hadn't just been solely focused, there might have been question marks over her level of experience if we hadn't said, actually, you know what, we just we we are committing to finding the right woman to do this, um, and that you know, and it was very easy to do that. And she then you know then went on to direct another series immediately, and she did a great job. She was fantastic to work with. She's a really good director. She went on to do another series immediately off the back of it. So. It, it was, yeah, it's, it's almost like what's been achieved is a zeitgeist thing. Whether, I don't know, maybe the last two or three years, the idea that anyone would contemplate a serious uh, film festival jury, any kind of film production, without having at least two or three heads of department who are women, it automatically invokes the word dinosaur. You mm -hmm. are out of touch. And this is a huge gain. I think this is what Jane Campion means. All of a sudden, from never mind, we'll let the women direct something, whatever. It's become also because I think in television, the shows done by women from Fleabag to Killing Eve to all of that, they've been shitload success. So these guys are not in it. It's like, wait, these girls have got the pounds on this, they're doing well. <laughs> yeah. The truth of the matter is that it is now a dinosaur thing to say it's going to be directed by all men. Is I, think, yeah, I think where we still have a huge issue in the UK is with um, is in terms of ethnicity. I think we still, I think in terms of women of colour or even and men of colour, I think we are still very woefully underrepresented in the industry, and there are still it's you know. So I think there's a long way to go in terms of because that takes um, time. The training, the yeah. training takes time. But that's also true around uh, disability. You know, we have targets and the the BFI Doc Society Fund, we do really well with them. Um, uh, but again, documentary is a good space for that because people are given a lot of opportunity to tell their story. But I think the other big problem in the UK is class and um, you know who controls what still is a class-based issue. And even with a lot of the changes that are happening, and, and a lot of the people that are making the changes still want to hold on to their position. So where, you know, where are these changes happening? And it's a much, much, much different conversation than in America, because you have lo loads of problems in America and we know what they are, but I don't think class is the same, is perceived in the same way as it is here. And in the same way of when you open your mouth in the UK, people make a judgment about you yes. instantaneously. It's true. Now, if you're American, you you they might make a different judgment, which is yeah. you're just an American, <laughs> um, but which that, has you know positives and negatives to it as well. But yeah, I don't yeah. think it works that way in America when people speak that you instantly know something but about what their background is, and then that means something to you. I, but that's true. The only thing I was well, going to say on that though is to make those films. Like I remember being an independent filmmaker in Canada and working on small films. Did. Bits, little bits in the states and here, it was here. No one was going to ask me, "Where's your permit?" Like you could steal a shot back. 
uh, here and, you know, and film safely here. But North America, I found it much more challenging around not class. And I agree with what you're saying. It's different North America. In North America, and I love the people in the U.S. to pitch in on this, like, you know, there are different challenges around finance and just having access to cash and, and have the privilege and time to make films. I mean, Speaking nowadays you do it on digital. Go well, ahead, Lisa. I'm just okay. curious, um, how many uh, people are in the meeting from, who else is in the meeting now? Because can we bring some of the uh, American uh, guests in to ask questions? And uh, I, 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 I just curious if, you know, what do we have 20 people in the meeting now? Or? Paul, your microphone's off. Sorry, my microphone is off. Julie Sharbat, yes, you. Hi. So the price is right. Come on down. Um, I was just thinking, uh, are you an American female writer, producer? Like, how do you think it is in the States? Um, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. This is such a cool panel. And thank you for sharing all of your experience. Um, <laughs> yes, I I am. I actually have a feature screenplay in in the festival this weekend. Um, I guess long story short, yeah, Paul, you just touched on the thing that I was actually typing a question as in as we were talking about it. Um, I so I made a feature film a few years ago. I made a follow up short that did very well in festivals in 2019, and then I had a little indie film that we were set to make last summer that, of course got squished um and i i've been writing screenplays that have been doing well in competitions but have found m financing the big leap that i um am having difficulty surmounting i finally signed with a manager and um i've had creative reception of these scripts i've written i've had creative producers interested in producing <laughs> these films but i have had so much trouble seeking out financing. So if I've exhausted crowdfunding and if I've exhausted self-funding, what is the next step? Well, we always, you know, on the fund, uh, you know, and, and, and there's a lot more uh, public funds in the UK than there are in the US, but there's a lot more philanthropists in, you know, and, and very business-minded and innovative, you know, philanthropists in the, in the US. And there's more money, public funding in the Europe. So everybody's got their issues, mm -hmm. <laughs> benefits. Yeah. But what we always tell people uh, is, uh, you know, look at the films that you like and get in touch with those producers. Because um, mm -hmm. it's, I don't know how else to get around it other than trying to find a good producing partnership and, you know, share the burden with it but it's just really incredibly hard, you know, keep the budget as low as you can. Mm -hmm. And really yeah. try to identify the audience. I mean, Rosa's had the best nose of, I remember being in Cannes where you were selling elephant, but that, what else were you selling that? Do you remember that year? Uh, and, thank God it's not every year, otherwise <laughs> I would not be standing. <laughs> No, but you know, I second what Lisa Marie says, when you start as a filmmaker, if you've made a feature and a short, and you go around the festival circuits and all of that, one thing everyone should tell you, or they should teach you, or you should be able to read, if you've not done it, is that filmmaking is a team effort. As long as you are a filmmaker with a script, every time starting with new finances and filmmaking, I mean, you're reinventing the wheel. The most important thing that you have is if you're lucky to run, into a production partner that wants to stay with you for the long run. For instance, there would be no Todd Haynes if there was no Christine Bachon meeting at school because Todd is an idiosyncratic filmmaker, a great American filmmaker, but she's been able to paddle through the ups and the downs because there is kind of thing. So, and it's, it's not about money, it's about finding someone who has the ambition and the understanding that this doesn't mean you have to be married for the rest of your life, but that there is a segment of time. I mean, the Todd and Christine is an exceptional one, but you know, some partnerships last five, six, seven years, and they're very productive in that. But you are every day in the same direction. Otherwise, Julie is a very lonely business. This is- And I also think, because um, my husband's a director and he, 
but he's not really a he's not a writer. So he goes where the scripts are. Uh, you know, if you're going to be a writer director, you, you know, you've you've got created that rod for your own back. But, that, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of benefits to that in terms of control and that, you know, but if you can get a, a little bit of a profile of the directing and you can get opportunities that aren't maybe really solely reliant on you having written it as well, which is a big time effort and a thing that keeps you out of the market, then, you know, going for opportunities that are you know, our directing only and jobbing director opportunities. And we see like, you know, Ken Loach has the, the relationship with Rebecca O'Brien. Um, Mike Lee had it with Simon Channing Williams, now Gail Egan. Those people that write often stay with the same producer. Um, the Coens, that kind of scene. The people that don't write tend to jump around because they got to go where the, where the script is. But also remember one thing, which is common sense, Julie. A lot of the finance guys don't like to deal with filmmakers directly. Yeah. They like to deal with them once it's a success, once they become famous, to do blah, blah, PR. But at the time of the nitty gritty, very few financiers, distributors like to deal straight with the creative because they often say very stupid things. <laughs> and it takes a producer like us to filter, negotiate and maneuver how we bridge that. So that's why you also get, even when you start, you tend to get the intermediaries, the John Schloss, the agents, the managers, uh, because there is a convention of willing and dealing, which is don't tell the filmmakers unless you're or let someone else do the dirty work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you also, you know, at the BFI in both film and, and, and sorry, in fiction and documentary, there needs to be a separate producer attached to the project. And that expectation is the producer is doing all of that work. And that includes like the business affairs as well. Um, and I really support that, even though, you know, other work will be done to do growth for the, the directors. But, you, you know, it's, it's a very rare situation where a director can carry both of those jobs, even though they might get a producer credit or yeah. on low budget stuff, they might have to do some of that work. But, you know, when you're actually in that really professional level of working in the main, uh, you know, like my husband doesn't deal with any, anything like that. Like sometimes you'll ask him what the budget is or what, and he'll be like, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> and it's, it's a relief to. And do, I think for a director, I, mean, your lane. <laughs> I, I think it was, I've, I've directed lots of theater, tons of theater. And, 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 and I'd say, Julie, like, you know, coming from low budget, everything, film it, steal the shot. You know, in Vancouver, there's a lot of collectives where I was, and you know, this is when we had to like, you know, film at the end of 16 millimeter, sh you know, scrap ends. You don't have to do that anymore. It's digital now. I love the fact that David Lynch made Eraserhead over six years and cast the same guy in small parts until the guy died because it just took him so long to make that film. Like, I think you, you know, writers write, directors direct, producers will help you produce. To extend what Lisa Marie was saying as well, when now I just produce in short film and I love it. But I say to the director, I'm not going to direct. I'll give you some notes on the on the script and everything else. But when you're on set, oh, who's having lunch? Who, where this going? That's not your problem. Your problem is to get the best out of the actors and to get the best shots. That's my job. And so, I, you know, I do think you do need a producer, but I also think you just need to get out there filming, get the script, and get it shot, however it means necessary. And who that's from the Rosa that? Bosch School. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa. Sorry, I'm just curious who else we have. I, I want to I want to hear from more of our um, guests if we. I mean. Thanks, Julie. Mm -hmm. There was this question from Yvonne about, and Lisa Marie answered about uh, A-listers. Would you like to expand on that, Yvonne? Mm -hmm. You're on mute. So if you unmute yourself, I'll unmute you. I think you're still on mute. There you hey, go. We should. Yep. Yeah, hey, here you are, Yvonne. Yeah. Okay, yes. First of all, thank you so much, everyone. It's wonderful. And um, it's interesting. Also, I just want to say something about Rosa, because Rosa was um, born in Spain, and I was born in Switzerland. 
And I moved to New York City in 1993 and met my American husband and never left either. So <laughs> no, I but, left my American husband. I'm gay now. So I did. We have a big difference. Okay. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. But I'm, anyhow, so I'm saying um, I have been a passionate storyteller all my life, but I started my career later in life. I had um, life just got in the way. But I finished my first screenplay, which um, has been an official selection in this wonderful festival. So thank you. Um, and I'm saying I was told by numerous people that because my story is based on a true story and it actually happens partially in Scotland. So the real protagonist is from Scotland. So I'm dealing also with um, kind of cultural differences. And I noticed whenever an American reviewer read my script, they had certain issues or they did not really understand certain things versus like when a European uh, reviewer read it. So I was told that because my protagonist and some characters really resemble um, strikingly two actresses and one particular actor and um, so I was told that if I could ever attract these, the great story that I wrote would be a total success. But then at the other hand, I was told that a screenwriter is not really supposed to make casting suggestions. Well, not the first time screenwriter. There's plenty of screenwriters of big, big name who have done it. But you can do that once you have a name. Once okay. you have a very, a very established name, okay, and have the ability, J.G. Ballard on Crash could say to Jeremy Thomas, "Why don't we have so and so? Why don't we have that?" But when you are a first timer, to send it to the casting, the casting, and unless one, the, the, my my friends here know Scotland better than me, but the rule doesn't change unless one of these actors is an actor that likes producing and acquiring material, they'll say, okay, very nice story, who's the director? So you're back to square one. <laughs> I don't know what you think, but it, uh, it doesn't work. No, I, I agree with Rosa. I think also, I mean, not to sound too negative, but it isn't a straightforward process getting to A-list cast. I mean, yeah. we see you need, you need a fantastic script. They will, and actors make decisions based on, num, you know, you, you, they will make decisions based on a number of factors. Sometimes yeah. that factor is purely the script. Sometimes that factor is the script and the director. Sometimes that factor is how much are they going to get paid. You know, it's it's there are multiple reasons that they would be attracted to a project. They also also the more you know, the, the depending on their stature in the industry as well, they right. will be surrounded by a lot of people who are filtering those decisions for them, whether that's agents or managers. Mm. Um, so it can be quite diff you know it's not a, there isn't a direct route you need you need I think Rose is right that the director is key um you need a very good casting director who has those relationships with the right. agents who can help navigate that um and I think because you know the actors want to most actors in my experience are really careful about what they decide to do and they want to be able to make a kind of informed decision about what the project is how realistic it is that it's going to get made if right. they attach their name to it who who's direct who's going to be directing them is obviously really really important and how it's going to be executed and how it will be distributed as well and I think exactly. they have to you know they know you know they know that the reason you're going to them is in order to tr attract financing so they have a lot of leverage in that situation as well right. understandably and rightly also, look, Yvonne, what I said earlier is a much more American thing than it is UK, since you mentioned Scotland, just because the infrastructure. The case I mentioned on, of uh, Nomadland, right. you know, it's a case we hear every 10 years or something. It's, I mean, there's a couple of Hollywood stars that have very active, Brad Pitt, you know, there's a couple of star-led production companies which are very efficient. Angelina Jolie had one for right. a while. But in, the, in Europe, this is extremely rare. Mm -hmm. Leading actors, there's a few actors that have got a little bit of production, but uh, it's a very rare occurrence that it starts like, it has to be someone 
very idiosyncratic, like Francis McDormand, okay. that can play by <laughs> the rules of the system in any way. It's a very rare thing. It's a, it's a sort of Hollywood fantasy from the 40s and 50s, when the very well-known writer could go to a star at a party and say, <laughs> I've written this for you. It's kind of, you know, uh, Orson Welles, uh, uh, Citizen Kane. It's interesting, is that, but I think in reality, it's more likely to happen at an independent way. So if you go to a film festival and you meet a young Scottish actor and you go out partying and you become friends, right. he may not help you finance the film, but if it's a young, talented guy you befriend, he right. may help you get a cool director, but forget the star, <laughs> you need to have a low budget film. Right. That story of becoming friends at the festival with someone who's just growing, right. that's, I don't know what you feel, Kate and Lisa, but that is more likely. Yeah. But I, does, that, does that answer your question? You've just got another great one coming from yes, Sarah yes, here. Thank you so very much. Yes, great. thank you so thank much. You, thank you so much. So uh, yeah, Sarah Holland had a question in chat. Would you like to ask that of the panel? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. This has been really fascinating. Um, but one of the questions that I had, I guess as a younger independent filmmaker, was how you guys felt uh, the internet and social media has impacted opportunities for independent filmmakers, seeing as you guys have been working in the industry for so many years. I have a few thoughts. I mean, one is it's great to, I, I definitely feel like I've learned more about, um, you know, new directors and female directors from the internet. Um, and so, you know, I think there's positive, you know, a lot of positives there. I think it's really important. I, I, I don't like lying. <laughs> and when people kind of change their credits or suggest they had different role on the project that they did. And, and, and I think there's a lot of that in the digital world mm -hmm. of um, just expanding out beyond what it is. And I think, you know, people should only say that they did the job that they're credited with doing because um, okay. yeah. you probably get caught out on that. And I also just, think people need to be very, very careful about stepping into arguments, <laughs> um, particularly on Twitter. We've seen people unravel by, you know, I, I think if one's going to do that, um, they really need to think about what they get out of it. You know, right? it's all well and good to just have your voice heard, but um, are you really saying something informed in a debate that is you know, progressing the debate in some informed way, uh, or are you just sounding off? And is that really helpful to you or anybody else? So I personally don't kind of engage in that stuff because I think it's a little bit of a minefield. But if you have like your own website and you have trailers and you just have that nicely presented, you know, that is a very nice way to be able to, when you do make contact with someone, like you should never send, like write to someone blind and go, here's my script, will you read it? Or here's, the, you know, people, they always say, no, <laughs> you need to kind of be invited if you're asking, but it is, you know, a shorthand to go, oh, here's my website or my Instagram or whatever, which is a link that someone can choose to take a peek at or my IMDB link, something that doesn't bring that whole burden of a request of many hours of engagement. So yeah, think about who you, ha who you are, what you want to say about the world uh, Kate. online. Kate, were you going to say something? Yeah, no, I was. I agree with a lot of what Lisa really said. I think what's what has been really good for from my perspective with social with social media is it opens up a kind of global a global opportunities, and you're no longer just in con conversation with people in your own country on, and it can provide a kind of route to getting to know people from around the world, which is really exciting. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can then translate that into opportunities to work together because you will be kind of, you may be confined by the kind of financing sort of opportunities within your own country. But I think it's really exciting to see that kind of flourish. I totally agree with Lisa Marie about the sort of negative sides of it. And I think, and, and it clearly it can be both a very um, exciting arena and it can be a very damaging arena for people I think um, so I think that's some and I and I can see that the pressure on actors I think is phenomenal in terms of their, the expectation that they have a kind of social media especially the younger actors um, and I saw that with um, 
the end of the fucking world and with Jess Barden, who overnight with the success of that show on Netflix, when was the kind of number one, you know, on the IMDb star rater, her Instagram followers went from, I think she had a hundred thousand when we were making the show. They literally overnight went to half a million and then overnight again went to over a million which is an unbelievable pressure on, she was 27 at the time, on a 27 year old actress, you know, to have suddenly be that exposed. And obviously she chooses to be on Instagram and she's very entertaining on it. Um, but it was very, uh, very, quite scary to see that explosion and to go, wow, you know, how, how is she gonna feel, how is she gonna manage that and keep her own, um, sanity and her own kind of integrity and the pressure is there to to do that to make yourself available to however many people want you to be available to them so I do think that's something to be aware of but it is a so I think I'm sure you're savvy about it and it's just making sure you protect yourself I mean I think I just that I think both Lisa Marie and Kate are on absolutely on the dot here, there is a big difference between how we use it or as Kate is mentioning, people who are in front of the camera. There's a big difference between in front and behind. In terms of in front of the camera, just about everyone now has a battalion of social media battlers. I've recently gone around on a launch where we were more social media uh, battlers than actors. I mean, there's just like so many people around. Now, for me personally, I don't do Twitter for the same reasons as Lisa Marie and Kate says, I do very little. I use Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. as a dissemination of information to very quickly see all sorts of news information from all over the world, largely Facebook, which is uncool up to a point because Latin America and Asia are very much Facebook. So that's a very quick way for me. I very seldom do debate. Last night I did one and I'm already feeling sorry. Last night I did one in a moment of uh, indignation of something that has built up over the last uh, two months. And I'm almost sorry because the amount of abuse I've got. Was like I'm really shocked about that, Rosa, because I thought, and as, as you have done through this whole session, you really look at things with a 360 degree view and you're like, yes, there's this, but there's also this. Why doesn't everyone think about this? I can't, I'm, I'm, I think I know what you're talking, are you talking about Johnny Depp? Um, I'm talking about Johnny Depp. Uh, yeah, and I, I was like, I think I liked it, but it was like, yeah, people, what went on with that press conference? You know, people behaving badly and people, you know, and him going off the rails, you know, a lot to be unpicked about that. So and why is it happening in that forum? But this is also something, I, I think I was, because look, I worked for Sam Sebastian for some time. I've also worked with John Depp in Lost, in Lost in La Mancha and can only say wonderful things about him as a professional. I make no judgment. What has become is this hangover on the cancel culture. And it's, it's again, back to Jane Campion, when the wall falls down, the guys on the other side of the wall start going, hey brother, we need to change. So for Johnny, I'm surprised. John is very ill advised at the moment and the festivals in Europe have been advised. So he doesn't have a recent film. He's in the middle of a personal imbroglio. I wish he went to the Bahamas, cool, sorted out his personal life. I really don't want to know anything about his personal life. I think he's the most amazing actor of his generation, but I really don't want to know whatever problems he's having. I think they should be out. They should not be debated in film festivals. Instead, he's been sent on a world tour of Carlo Vivari life achievement, San Sebastian life achievement, Dobil life achievement. And yesterday was the straw that broke the camel. The press conference, the moderator says, we are here to talk about the career, the film career of Johnny Depp. It starts with film. Then there is a question from a guy about, so how do you feel, you poor soul? You've been treated so badly, C cancel culture. So Johnny makes this big impassioned thing, which is on all the newspapers today, Deadline, Hollywood, Variety, The Guardian, you name it, saying that, you know, no one is safe, it will happen to you. He's doing a, a sort of thing. And then another journalist comes in and says, the Spanish Audiovisual Women's Association has very considerately said, Johnny Depp is a great actor, but given that there is all this embroglio, this is not 
the moment to give him a forum. So the moderator says to this poor guy, sorry, we're not, we're only talking about film, but, and that, now this is, I grew up during Franco, we are not going back to doing Russian press conference where we say, <laughs> you cannot speak. So I got a little bit worked up, perhaps the painkillers of my accident. <laughs> So, so I, this is being recorded. Let's just remind you. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I look, I, those of you who know me, and I think, thank you, Lisa Marie, I am passionate and I can have a bit of a personality, but I also think that I'm a well conceited person that looks at all you the are. areas. And I cared about San Sebastian. I was the first woman on that management committee. And I closed my, you can all look at it on Facebook. I closed by saying, if I was working for the festival, I would have to consider stepping down. Because why didn't we give the Life Achievement Award to Sofia Loren, who made a fantastic film last year, or Claudia Cardinale, or my God, there's plenty of people. It's not like there is. And I think these double standards, I feel sorry for Johnny, but the festivals, film festivals are not a forum in which to air your private dirty laundry. We're here about to talk about films. And this is, a specific case, because I'm not taking sides as to whether Amber or him is right or wrong. I don't care. It's their life, it's their business. What I care about is, is a reaction. I could say there is a reaction to saying, oh, poor guys, it's all about the girls now, unless you're a woman, you don't win the pound. You know, there's a little bit of that, which I think is suspicious. The abuse I got today was not on Facebook. The abuse was actually on my phone. All oh, right. I'm so shocked by that. Yeah. It was so, I'm, saying, I'm, Sarah, I'm sure we've answered your question, or do you need to get anything <laughs> more with that? No, I, this is why oh, I love so it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Sarah. This was probably beyond. But t take the take the long explanation. Look, the uh, Johnny Depp is not the only one. There has been a few others on this. The Johnny Depp is perhaps more notorious, but there is at the same time as women are gaining space. As Kate says, you know, people now finally trust me with going to the ice cubes of the North Pole. Uh, they finally, you know, no one will contemplate a series without a woman director. At the same time as we gain, there is these other forces trying to put the dinosaurs back in. Mm -hmm. But Jurassic Park is over. There's, there's no stopping this. There's no more Jurassic Park here. So this and is I, I, I'm a little bit passionate about yeah. it. It is not acceptable. I totally agree with that. And I also would say that the dinosaurs ain't just the old people. You know, you Correct. still have people with very narrow thinking and going, this is how you make films and this is what I'm going to back. Um, I'm just want to make people aware that it's just five past the hour. So I'm happy to stay on if you guys are. Uh, we do, it's, we, um, but I'm not sure Lisa Kay in, in our panel, how you're doing for time. I'm sorry oh. about the- uh, yeah. Oh, that was Should good. Don't on? apologize. Sorry. Does, I, I would like to, um, you know, I want to talk about the uh, the Angel Awards, unless uh, great because we've got this question from Julie Shaw, but I'll let you, Julie. I just answered it. I Perfect. just Thank answered you, Lisa it. Marie. <laughs> and we'll get, so um, we're just gonna just because of the time, we're gonna hand over to Lisa K. Because uh, as uh, Rosa Bosch was talking about all the wonderful awards that she went and saw being presented this year at the festivals, we just want to talk a little bit about the Angel Awards. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank you all for such an amazing uh, conversation today. And uh, this is this is why I did this festival so that, you know, women uh, of all backgrounds, age, uh, you know, diversity, we can all come together and learn from each other and also acknowledge uh, each other's achievements. And with that, we have something uh, that we do every year at the festival, which is called the Angel Award. And the Angel Award goes to individuals of extraordinary ability who really are of inspiration to women in the film industry. And so with that, what I would like to do is start with a little special award for Lisa Marie Russo here today. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> for, for, for your inspiration, this is what it reads. I don't know if you can read it, Lisa. Can you read that? I'll hold it up more to the camera. For inspiration to women in the film industry for your extraordinary work as a producer. <laughs> How kind. So, so that's for you. We will be sending it to the UK to uh, right. get your request from Paul. 
So we just want to acknowledge your amazing uh, contributions and uh, your, your uh, contribution today to this incredible conversation. And uh, you can speak a little bit about that and then we will move on because we have a couple more awards. Well, thanks. You know, it's all about the uh, filmmakers. Like, so great to be able to collaborate with fabulous people in front of and behind the camera. It's a fun, you know, a fun world to be part of. I hope this made yeah. your day. It does. It does. Yeah, hey, you went for a walk with me today, lady. I know, and I Come didn't on. know. You kept it all secret. <laughs> now, I would like to say we, ha we do have another Angel Award. <laughs> and my goodness. Kate Osborne's name is on this one. <laughs> Kate, can you read it? Can you read it out loud for everyone? Yeah. I'm going to put a face mask. I can't read it. Kate. <laughs> Back to front. I can't read it. No, it's all right. It's all right. Ooh. No, sorry. I still can't. No, yeah, it's all right. It's, it's, all right. It's, it's for inspiration to women in the film industry for your extraordinary work as a producer. Thank you very much. Well, You're very welcome. We'll be, I'll get your address and we'll be shipping that to you. Thank you. Do you have anything well, to say, Kate? I'll, I'll share that with them, the incredible women that I've worked with, including Lisa Marie. Ah, oh, well, congratulations to both of you. And oh my gosh, there's a third <laughs> one. There's a third one here. Yes, hat trick. It's a hat trick. I pulled this out of a hat in the, in, the, in the 11th hour of this panel. Oh my goodness. And it's for an angel award presented to Rosa Bosch. Can you read it? You know what it all says. Yes. You even spelled my name right. Well done. Thank you. We try. We do try here. Thank you so much, Lisa. Very touched. You're nice very to welcome. Know. Yeah. Rosa, for anyone else that gives you grief, just put a picture of the award. <laughs> There's, they're um, kind of supposed to resemble an angel wing. I, that's, I tried and that best. works, that works. Right. Uh, <laughs> any final thoughts from the panel? Thank you for that, Lisa. And well done, you're well deserved. But any fly and be free, panel? that's what I say. <laughs> Put on your angel wings and fly and fly. Out. <laughs> fly through your evening now. <laughs> I wanted to ask the person who I think is disappeared, whose last name was Kluge. Amanda, are you there? You are not related to a German filmmaker called Kluge, are you? Don't tell me. You are real. Are you what? Granddaughter? I'm, 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 uh... Uh, I'm mute. I'm mute. I'm mute. I'm mute. I'm mute. Sorry. Are you related to Alexander Kluge? I, yes, I am. Wow. I am. We're actually, uh, our original name is Van Klung. Yeah. But yes, I am. I'm so, so glad that you noticed that. <laughs> That's so crazy. Well, I've met him quite a few times. Uh, how, uh, what are you? Um, uh, oh, you mean what do I do in the industry? No, no. What What are you? Gra are you niece, granddaughter? What are you? Oh, granddaughter, granddaughter. Okay. I'm yes. Uh, we originally, um, our family came over here to to Philadelphia. I'm originally from Philadelphia. So oh, and and her grandfather was very well known because in fact we were talking recently about doing. You, some of you know I'm on the international Oscars panel. Uh, committee and we were thinking about doing on disability doing pioneers of disability so randa hain were children of a lesser god the sort of pioneers that did it early and it was coming to mind that i've only ever known a filmmaker who suffered from blindness he wasn't completely correct me is he alive he's still alive or he's dead um <laughs> he passed he, he just passed actually yes very recently oh. not a year or two ago yeah but he had partial blindness. Yes. So the filmmaker who became well known at the same time as the German New Wave, Bim Benders, Herzog, wow. all of those guys, friends with all of that, and partially blind, and some very beautiful films. Um, so wow. he was a pioneer of, uh, of, of- He was amazing. In as much as he was partially blind, which is, you know, John Ford was also partially blind, which, you know, mm -hmm. he was filming with one eye. Um, yes. That was the end of his life. John Houston, sorry. No, Ford as well, both of them. <laughs> um, but in the case of your grandfather, who is really a fundamental uh, filmmaker in German cinema, and I had the pleasure of meeting him in Berlin a few times at the beginning of life. So you are also in film. I, I am. <laughs> Thank you for that so much. Oh. <laughs> 
So sorry about the loss of your phone. Because <laughs> you've been a bit forgotten, but you'll see there'll be retrospectives any moment. But what are you, a writer, director, producer? What? Well, I actually um, started off as an actor. I came to Los Angeles and uh, became a publicist for the stars, <laughs> wanting to know more about the industry I was a part of. I left to do um, producing. I produced um, uh, a couple of shorts and, and, and a feature, um, still acting, but also doing um, freelance PR because it's something that people don't aren't aware of that mm. is extremely important. And I thought I would lend my services to the City of Angels Film Festival. Great. Well done. She's our publicist. She's our publicist for the first <laughs> And I'm our publicist this year. Yes. Everyone yeah. will tell you that any producer worth their salt, if you don't understand the art of publicity, you've got a handicap. You got to know how to make them, how to sell them, how to babysit them. And PR is a key thing in there. So and she's amazing yeah. at it. She uh, Amanda oh, thank is you. I just got to tell you guys what a wonderful uh, person, number one, and most importantly. I recommend you Google Alexander Kluger. It's some interesting films there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> How do we all stay in touch? Can we get uh, emails and what well, we do have each other's emails? Well, um, I'm just going to put this up just because I know people have to go and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, all that lovely stuff. Um, I'm just going to go back and remind people that this is about the City of Angels uh, Film Festival. It's starting tomorrow. There's a coffee mixer, but you can email info at cityofangelsfilmfest.com. Uh, you'll see the lovely Kate Crisetto. And I'm sure the beautiful Amanda Klug uh, will, uh, <laughs> may, may receive a few of those emails as well. Um, and uh, I think we just need to wrap it up. I'm more than happy to hang out with people and uh, there will be the Angel Awards on Saturday with Peter Bogdanovich is getting a special award there uh, from 6.30 p.m. at the Bella Blanca Event Center in Los Angeles, California. I think it's near North Hollywood, is that right? Yeah, it's in North yeah. Hollywood. Great, and so- And, and, yeah. and, the, and the actual theater is in Sherman Oaks and uh, everyone who's been on this that, that I haven't seen, we look forward to seeing you at the theater. So thank you again for uh, participating today. Thanks everybody. It was really, it was amazing. I'm, I've got tears in my eyes now because of this connection, you know. <laughs> Such Thank a small you so much. world. Thank Thanks you, everyone. everyone.